Hello, and welcome to Looking Up, A View from the Valley. My name is Mark Weissman, and thank you very, very much for watching. I'm very excited about this brand new television show that will hopefully be educational and informative for the entire family. The premise of the show is to take a positive, nonprofit, and unique perspective on the lower Naugatuck Valley region. For the purposes of this show, that will include Shelton, Derby, and Sonia, Seymour, Naugatuck, Beacon Falls, and Oxford. The scope of the show will encompass various topics that are prevalent in just about every community in the United States, but particularly what's unique about them here in the Naugatuck Valley. For instance, the historical perspective, as this area of the country being part of New England has a significant amount of historical and Revolutionary War artifacts. Culture and arts, where every town in this region has a dedicated cultural commission to produce either summer concerts or an annual town festival or events such as those. The Parks and Recreation Departments, uh, where there's a lot of activities and outdoor fun that the entire family can have. Some of the educational programs, both city-run schools and also the nonprofit organizations that work in conjunction with those schools. The senior centers, the libraries, the Valley United Way, which does an enormous amount of volunteer work. If you have any comments on the show, feel free to provide feedback, questions, or suggestions to lookingupvalley at gmail.com or check out our Facebook page and dedicated website. Thank you very much. We're here with Dr. Steve Tracy, Superintendent of Schools, the Derby Public School System, uh, Kathy Williams, who's director of the Derby Public Library, and Linda Coppola, former principal of Bradley School in Derby and now principal of St. Mary and St. Michael. Welcome. Thank you very Thank much you. for coming. Uh, what I wanted to cover and talk to you, there's all of you in some way are uh, work uh, primarily with children in, in either the school systems, outside programs, and what I wanted to talk about is some of the, some of the differences and also some of the commonalities between the, the, your three perspectives and some of the programs that are, that are done in your, in your uh, areas. So first of all, I'm aware of there's a, there's a program called the Derby Discovery Committee that is founded or that is, I guess, works with the Parent Resource Center in Derby. And all three of you are involved in that. And I guess if yes. you could talk about uh, in what capacity you're involved and some of the things that that program does in general and then what specifically each of you have done to, to perhaps contribute to that. School readiness started in Derby in 1998, and Kathy was part of that mm -hmm. uh, when we started at Irving School. And at that time, it was state-funded just for three and four-year-olds four for the two years preceding kindergarten. Mm -hmm. But out of school readiness has evolved the discovery and the Graustein Foundation, uh, which has funded many of our initiatives. So now, really, the program is for children, not just in preschool, but up to age Eight, eight, right. up to age eight. So it has encompassed more children. Excellent. And I guess, so, how long have you been involved with that? Since 1998. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay, excellent. And I guess if you were to look back at some of the changes that have gone uh, from the very beginning, what would you say the most significant changes have been? Well, as I said, we started out with funding just for 16 students at Irving School, and now um, we have a coordinator, Connie Condon, and she has expanded it to um, educating our pre-K teachers and having workshops for home daycare providers so that all of the young children in Derby, because we're primarily focused on Derby children, have the same skills when they enter kindergarten, and that really is the purpose of that whole program. Excellent. And, and Kathy, as far as your involvement with that program? Um, uh, well, I'm on the, both the Readiness um, Counts Committee and the Derby Discovery Committee. Mm -hmm. um, I started a little after Linda, and um, the library is more of a support role. Um, we have a lot of programs here. The um, home providers used to meet here until they outgrew us. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, we do some uh, parenting workshops here. We, we they're held here, and um, the kindergarten roundtable. You have hosted that. Yeah, we've hosted uh, yeah. for pre K. Linda. Connie Condon uh, yearly would have a meeting between the pre K teachers, mm -hmm. in all of the centers in the Derby and Sony area, and the kindergarten mm -hmm. teachers. Mm -hmm. And we've encouraged the uh, the staff in the preschool programs and the daycare programs to come visit our elementary schools as well as direct uh, uh, families to come over, encourage early kindergarten registration so that the schools can know who's coming and 
what their profile, what their needs might be. So is the program actually set up within the school system, or is it, a, is it sort of a nonprofit outside of the school it's system? It's mostly outside. It's mostly the work that, that Connie does to encourage contacts and information and, like, as I say, visits, early registration, screening, things mm -hmm. of that sort, mm -hmm. uh, because all of these kids eventually are heading to kindergarten either at Linda's Place or at, at the school system. Mm -hmm. And the sooner they register and the more they know about uh, services, especially services for special needs children that may actually be available before the child becomes of kindergarten age, sure, we start sure. serving youngsters with uh, uh, handicapping conditions as young as three. So the sooner those connections are made, the better. And the Discovery program and the readiness program help us to do that. Mm -hmm. I was going to add also that one of the other agencies connected is the Even Start program, and that has helped us reach the families who speak other languages mm -hmm. so that those children get in for the kindergarten screening. And really, that's probably one of the biggest changes mm -hmm. that came about through this initiative. They, um, th through the funding, were able to do a lot of advertising in January through banners and billboards so that the families do come in and register in January or earlier than Labor Day weekend, <laughs> which used to be sure. the case, you know. Yeah. But the outreach to the non-English speaking parents has been a big help. M Michelle Holovac's group, Even Evenstart, and um, it, it really is uh, all agencies working together. We have representatives from Parent Child Resource Center on that discovery. Um, Head Start, of course, mm -hmm. Valley Even Start, the Family Resource Center, and Sonia. So it's a collaborative effort. Sure. Mm -hmm. Now that's the intent. The impression I get, is, like you said, it's for sometimes it's for kids with special needs. So do they? Is there a transitional between, let's say, the paras or the the the, people, the uh, professionals within all of the schools, per se, that are already addressing special needs? How is the transition done from what's done in the, ready, in the Derby Discovery Program to the actual school system? Well, there's a number of ways that uh, special needs youngsters can come to our attention. Sometimes it could be the, uh, the child care provider who, who notices and has certain concerns and may call us up. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it's a parent directly, um, and, and we begin to encourage visits and, and, as Linda said, early registration so that we have a few months rather than a few days to, right. to know who these youngsters are and to begin serving them. And then, of course, the children who are receiving services um, through birth to three, they have already been identified, and there's always a transition meeting when they're ready to enter our schools. Mm -hmm. So, you know, those children have a smooth transition to the school district sure. because they've already been identified through uh, birth to three. Oh, that's good. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Pam Lorenzo. I'm the chair of the Valley Early Childhood Task Force. And for those of you who are wondering about kindergarten registration, kindergarten registration for the following towns will take place in January of 2012. In Ansonia, it will be at the Resource Fair at Prendergast School on January 21st from 9 to 1 p.m. We do have a snow date of January 28th. In Derby, at all of the elementary schools between the week of January 17th and January 20th. In Seymour, we will also be doing registration at all of the elementary schools from January 10th through January 12th, and also at the Seymour Public Library, January 11th through the 25th, between 5 and 7 p.m. And Shelton, we will do also at all the elementary schools the week of January 22nd. Remember, Kindergarten is the foundation for future learning. Thank you. Now you mentioned also the readiness program, which sounds like a little bit different. Than, now I'm, I'm aware Shelton has a readiness program. I imagine some of the other valley towns. Do you know in general or even more specifically what the difference is? Or you know, let's say, if you were to compare the Derby Readiness Program with the Shelton, do you work with the other towns in the Valley? Um, and if not, though, do you know just how one differs from the other? Basically, the goal is all the same with all the towns. They might be, they might differ a little in some of the activities. And there's another, actually, there is another group called the Early Childhood Task Force, okay. which is a subcommittee of the Valley Council. And at, the, at those meetings, all the coordinators from the readiness, um, readiness councils from throughout the Valley meet and share their ideas and update on what each is doing. 
and some of the members of the Derby School Readiness Council serve on the other boards. Okay. So they're familiar with what Ansonia is doing, Shelton, mm -hmm. Seymour. Derby was the first to get the school oh, readiness really? program in 1998, but Ansonia's program is much larger. They have much more um, mm -hmm. funding. Mm -hmm. So it depends on how much your funding is yeah. as to Where how many does children. The, come from for that the state. From the state. It's so the state the school readiness program. Yes. So now, now, Linda, you have a you have a uh, I guess an experience now with where you are at St. Mary's St. Michael's, where there was a lot of grants necessarily needed for some of the things you've done. You've you've been involved in getting some of those grants awarded. Can you just talk just a little bit about some of the things you've been able to start up that weren't there now in just your first year? You know. Like all private schools, we struggle financially because the tuition does not cover the cost of educating our students. So we've had to look to the Valley Community Foundation, the New Haven Foundation, the Matthews Foundation, and we were awarded grants from all of those groups. So we were able to have a drama club last year. That's just one thing that we were able to do that was not at the school previously, and we just received a grant from the Matthews Foundation for a small playground for our pre-K and K children. So we could never have afforded that through our operating budget. Mm -hmm. So we do look for grants all the time. And you have smart boards, I understand? Then? Yes. Some of that was through grant money and also from private donors. Excellent. Now, a, a, a typical public school system being different, I guess, from a private system, are, is there, are there grants that, are, that a, school is, a public school necessarily is entitled to? In a couple of categories. One, there, there are entitlement grants that we're uh, uh, entitled to get if mm -hmm. we file the proper application and if we have the, the students who require those services and the largest of those is uh, something called Title I of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act uh, which in the case of Derby provides about three hundred and forty thousand dollars a year for uh, assistance to low-income children so that's based in part on the number of low-income youngsters that you mm -hmm. have in a school or, mm -hmm. or in the district. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also uh, other assistance under, under the uh, various federal laws for professional development, for uh, language training for youngsters for whom English is not the first language. Mm -hmm. uh, there's some support for technology, for vocational education. So we take advantage of as many of those as we can. Uh, one of our challenges in getting grants from the private sector, some of the, the private philanthropies, is that uh, um, their expectation is, well, you, you have access to government funds and the tax base of the city, why are you asking us for help with right. this or that exactly. program? Exactly. And the, the short answer is that as budgets have become more constricted over the last few years, we found ourselves uh, either needing to cut back on programs or to look outside for, for additional resources. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the common themes that cut across all three of our organizations is the fact that uh, there are a number of deserving families in our community who need support and assistance, especially if you're talking about single, single parent families. Um, and yet the resource space, the public resource space has, has been constrained. Mm -hmm. The uh, mm -hmm. um, increased uh, dollar amount that, that we've received over the last three or four years has been easily outstripped by inflation, the cost of health care, the cost of utilities, labor agreements, things of that sort. So mm -hmm. even though the budgets inch up a little bit, uh, the number of services that you can provide with those dollars has actually been shrinking, and yet students are still expecting to be served, parents still expect a good school system. So sure, that, that compels us to look for outside financial support, and it also compels us to cooperate with one another to a greater extent than, mm -hmm. than we mm -hmm. needed to do uh, five or ten years ago. Right, and you mentioned some of the programs where you may have to cut back. I mean, one of the one of the tri typical ones that you know is is addressed first or tends to be are art or music programs, which is why you mm -hmm. know you having a drama club is actually a significant accomplishment. When typically that's the type of uh, thing that is cut first. Um, the Derby Music Program. I mean, if you were to say, you know, what the, what the future holds for um, the arts and music and drama and things like that, where would you put that in the priority list? They're very important. Uh, I, I don't regard uh, art and music as uh, luxuries or extra items. Uh, they speak to different uh, aspects of the intelligence of children, mm -hmm. and it may be that for some child the opportunity to draw or express herself through music is the, is the, the most comfortable, most powerful way mm -hmm. that, that he or she can feel good about mm -hmm. themselves and, and gain some insight into their talents. Uh, so I don't regard those as extras at all. Having said that, Everything ends up on the table with sure, these uh, very sure. difficult budget conversations, sure. especially when you get to the end and you don't have enough money to cover everything. And the school board, with whatever guidance the uh, 
principals and staff and I can provide need to make some very tough choices. Uh, we, uh, we are uh, leaning even more heavily now on, on the Derby Public Library on Derby Neck because our schools no longer have librarians. That's mm -hmm. something that we lost mm -hmm. a couple of budgets ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, each year, hopefully, well, maybe we'll get them back next year, but next year always has its own challenges and, and the pressure seems mm -hmm. to be not to add but to reduce. Right. I mean, given the proximity of it, I mean, in a way, it almost makes sense to do it that way. Sure. Because you, as, as combining, you know, the two libraries that are in town, obviously, they're, one is private and one is public, but, but you know, the resources that could be made available, either computer resources or, or literature, mm -hmm. um, would maybe even open up things. Because, Kathy, correct me if I'm wrong, you're, there's the library itself is entitled to grants, let's say, separate from the school systems, correct? I mean, right. to maintain and, and continue what's being done here, correct? Yes. No, our location is, it, it can't be our location, mm -hmm. uh, right in the middle of St. Mary's right. and Irving. So, um, cr uh, Classes do come over. We have several classes a week that come over from They're both here of the right schools. Now. That's yeah. right. My first and second <laughs> graders are downstairs. From both mm -hmm. of the schools, and um, and actually talking about readiness, uh, the readiness class comes over here, also. Or our children's librarian Sue Sherman goes over mm -hmm. to the readiness class mm -hmm. to do some story times. So uh, our location is a great asset to working together. We're doing as much as we can to take advantage of everybody's sure, assets here absolutely. because. Uh, individually, we're we're all on the spot. We've we've uh, the school system has been able, uh, despite these financial constraints, to hang on to two or three things that are very important for young children. It's all about priorities. Uh, we continue to offer a full day kindergarten here. That's something that started back when Linda was a principal in one of our schools, uh, and that's one of the few areas where you know Derby is in some ways ahead of other communities who who wish they had full day kindergarten. Mm -hmm. That ends up on the table every year, and it's it's very vociferously defended by staff and parents and so far we've been able to maintain that so when a child uh, comes into the Derby school system as a five-year-old uh, they have a full day experience and that gives them a leg up as they get ready for you know, first grade and beyond. Uh, the other thing that we've started a couple of years ago is a uh, focus on primary reading first and second graders. We mm -hmm. have a very intensive professional development program for teachers in those early grade levels uh, that was uh, launched through an outfit called Literacy How that provides weekly professional development to help teachers become more effective at teaching reading. The theory being that if you start young, by the time they get to third grade, mm -hmm. uh, you know, th these kids can be accomplished in terms of reading and that unlocks all the other subjects. So uh, we, we are constantly pressured to cut but we have tried to preserve some of these early learning opportunities for kids because that's that's really the launching pad that that hopefully will carry them on to success. Oh, absolutely! It's interesting you mentioned that the focus in this case was the reading because mm -hmm. I think about what is it when you get to the high school level or even the college level or, or the the STEM initiatives that are that are really countrywide, not just you know locally, um, and science, technology, and and in some cases you know the, the kids need kids at, at what at even the youngest age need to focus more on let's say math and science as well um, and, I, and I guess I think back to tying it into the music programs because I, there's no doubt a connection between math and science ability and uh, being a musician mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. so I guess if you look at it that way in addition to the reading what, what sort of things and this goes for really all three of you what sort of things are being done from a science technology engineering even at the even at the pre-k level you know to get kids and especially girls who tend to be, you know, necessarily not necessarily geared or or encouraged to go in that direction. What what sort of things are done um, on those with those subjects? Well, for one thing, over the last several years, the uh, science instruction has been included in the Connecticut uh, mastery test. So now, in, not every year, but in fifth and eighth grade, the state is assessing, you know, youngsters in terms of science literacy, and and that you know that puts a spotlight on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, our our focus really has been more on the reading. I. Um, you know, we, we have science instruction as part of our instruction K through 12, sure. but when forced to decide if you can only focus in one area to make, uh, you know, real progress, we, we've selected, uh, you know, reading and along with that all day kindergarten as things we want to hang on to. Um, so we, we don't have, uh, we've actually been forced at the high school level to cut back on some of the uh, technology offerings that we used to have simply because you have to cover the basics as are required by the state mm -hmm. and when you get down to those final budget discussions 
and you can't afford all the programs oh, sure. and all the classes, uh, then we tend to fall back on those those core subjects that are required for, for graduation and um, you know, special ed services that are required sure. by law. Sure. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned high school. I believe one of the, I saw a student in the library. She's mentioned that you guys offer a forensics course. Is that correct? There, there is a forensic science course that's right. been very popular up there for that's some years. That, that, honestly, when I saw that, and then you know, and obviously a lot has been published about the CAP scores and yeah. where they said, and I'm thinking, you know, that should be the headline of a newspaper article yeah. that Derby High School is offering forensics because I know right here at UNH, University of New Haven, mm -hmm. you know, is one of the leading forensic studies. So to have a kid exposed to that, you know, before they get there, um, are there other courses like that that you know the general public may not be aware of? That, well, we do we do have some courses that we offer in connection with the University of Connecticut, where our teachers are are qualified to, uh, in, in a sense, serve as adjunct professors and. And that course, if you complete it satisfactorily, counts as a UConn credit if you go right. on to school there. Uh, and, and we do have a, a limited number of advanced placement courses, not as many as we'd, we'd like to see because it becomes difficult to uh, justify in the budget offering a course to 12 or 14 advanced students in a small high school right. who want to pursue something. So that is a challenge. Uh, one of the things that we're looking at uh, for the future, the school board has just received uh, a draft strategic plan and um, one of the more controversial uh, recommendations in that plan is that the board ought to look at some kind of regionalization. Should we be joining forces at the high school level or even K through 12 with some of our neighbors and mm -hmm. trying to develop mm -hmm. uh, schools that may have more economies of scale and the wherewithal to offer a greater variety of courses than we can offer in a high school that's got less than 400 students in mm -hmm. it now. Uh, we, we're also gonna have to look at things like online learning so that we sure. can offer courses that are of interest only maybe to a handful of students uh, that can be done more cost effectively if you're using technology as opposed to trying to assemble a class and hiring a teacher and right. so forth. Right. Sure. So again, the economic realities are gonna force us to look at things like online learning, like regional coordination mm -hmm. that maybe five years ago people would not have been thinking about. So these issues are in front of the school board now, and we're going to be holding some hearings in November to get public uh, input on these topics good. Good. and uh, eventually try to set some new courses for ourselves. So when parents come in to ask about St. Mary's, St. Michael's, they always ask about the curriculum. That's mm -hmm. always on their mind. And although we have, we're located in Derby, we only have 50% of our students from Derby, 20% are from Ansonia, and then the rest are from Seymour, Oxford, various towns. So they always ask about curriculum. and you know, we do spend a lot of time on reading. However, there is a difference because in the Catholic school, we are guided by the archdiocesan standards. So we teach social studies, science, geography in the eighth grade, handwriting, um, in addition to the math and reading. So, you know, a lot of parents are always asking about that because we don't take the Connecticut Mastery Test. We do take the Iowa Test in March. Mm -hmm. But it's not as stringent as those CMTs are mm -hmm. and you know so we have a, a more diverse curriculum I would say and the teachers um, are able to get to those subjects. The sense I get from that is that because you don't have let's say the minimum requirements or that it, it gives you kind of the freedom to maybe offer courses that normally like for instance in your case if you, because you have these standards to meet not that, not that those standards aren't necessary and well thought out but it, it, it's like you have to make decisions based on that. Well, we need to meet these, so we have mm -hmm. to make sacrifices elsewhere. Whereas, because you don't have, quote unquote, the same criteria, you're able to offer other things. Well, the public schools offer them. I'm not trying to say they yeah. don't, because okay. we do okay. teach social studies and science in yeah. the elementary schools, and I don't want to mislead anyone. Mm -hmm. However, we have more flexibility. You know, we don't have to spend two and a half hours on reading. We have a 90 minute literacy oh, block. We have okay. a one hour math block, but we're able to fit it in. And the handwriting is a big thing. <laughs> because mm -hmm. a lot of our students who transfer from public schools, the parents say, well, my child has never learned cursive. And as I said, these are all various towns. It's, right, I'm not talking right, right. about Derby. And so, you know, we have to catch them up with the handwriting. So it's, you know, the Catholic school education is still the same basic skills as when I went to school many, many years ago. <laughs> <laughs> That's all. You're being kind, Steve. <laughs> but, you know, nothing has changed there.
Hi, I'm Pam Lorenzo. I'm the chair of the Valley Early Childhood Task Force. And for those of you who are wondering about kindergarten registration, kindergarten registration for the following towns will take place in January of 2012. In Ansonia, it will be at the Resource Fair at Prendergast School on January 21st from 9 to 1 p.m. We do have a snow date of January 28th. In Derby, at all of the elementary schools between the week of January 17th and January 20th. In Seymour, we will also be doing registration at all of the elementary schools from January 10th through January 12th, and also at the Seymour Public Library January 11th through the 25th, between 5 and 7 p.m. And Shelton, we will do also at all the elementary schools, the week of January 22nd. Remember, kindergarten is the foundation for future learning. Thank you.